Welcome to this service from the Pitt Street Uniting Church. We are gathering online instead of meeting together during this time of responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. We welcome all people regardless of race, sex, creed, age, cultural background, sexual orientation, gender identity or intersex status. Wherever you are on your faith journey, Wherever you have come from and wherever you are going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome here. In our humanity, we bring our longings for connection with the spirit of love, for connection with others, and for connection with ourselves. Let us celebrate life held in divine presence. As we gather, we acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, land that was taken from them without their consent, treaty or compensation. The Spirit of God has long dwelled with the first peoples of this ancient land. We honour the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on which Pitt Street Uniting Church building is situated and pay our respects to their elders as we gather to worship God. The Uniting Church in Australia believes that all people are made in the image of God. As a Christian community, we believe God reaches out to us in love and acceptance and that our relationships with each other should express love and respect and not be abused. God of presence, as you walked upon the water to meet the disciples, meet us in the midst of the storms in our lives. Spirit of renewal, as you lifted Peter from the water, lift us from despair to hope, from distraction to focus, from death to life source of hope for the journey. Direct us in your way. 
work out your purpose in and through our lives. We light the Christ candle, a symbol of the light of Christ that lights the way. We also light a rainbow candle for the children and young people among us, aware that it is the young people around the world who will benefit or suffer from our actions today. Let us pray. Spirit of creation, brooding over the waters of our chaos, inspire us to generous living. Wind of liberation, dancing over the deserts of our reluctance, lead us to the oasis of celebration. Breath of divine presence, inspiring communication among strangers, make us channels of your peace. Where kindness and love are found, God is here. Remembering Jesus, who showed us the way of divine presence, we pray together. God, you are life for us. Holy be your name. Your new day come, your will be done on earth as in your vision. Give us this day our bread for the morrow and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Strengthen us in the time of test, and deliver us from evil. For the power and the splendour and the fulfilment are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear the words of assurance. We are free in the Holy One to live, choose, and love with passion and compassion in our hearts. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to share a sign of peace with those in your household or to offer a word of peace for the world. May the peace of God be with you. Hear words of faith in the Hebrew scriptures from the book of Genesis. This is the story of a family of Jacob known as Israel. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the children of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's spouses. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was a child of his old age. And he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him best, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, 
Are not your brothers pastoring the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. Joseph answered, Here I am. So Israel said to Joseph, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring back word to me. So Israel sent Joseph from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and someone found him, wandering the fields, and asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The person said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to another, Here comes this dreamer. Come, now let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits and shall say that a wild animal has devoured him. And we shall see what has become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered them out of his hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him. Reuben's intention was to rescue Joseph and restore him to Israel. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, carrying garm, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they took Joseph to Egypt. For the stories of our ancestors in faith, we give thanks. Listen for words of faith in the letters. Romans 10, 5 to 15. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if we confess with your lips that Jesus is sovereign and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in God will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same creator is creator of all and is generous to all who call. For everyone who calls on the name of the Most High shall be saved. But how are they to call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in the one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim to them? And how are they to proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. For insights from the early Christian communities, thanks be to God.
Hear words of faith from the Gospel of Matthew. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after Jesus had, dismiss, had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And again in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, If it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Jesus, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught Peter saying, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat showed great reverence saying to him, Truly, you are God's own. For the stories of Jesus and the beloved community, we give thanks. Whenever I hear this gospel story being read, my thoughts go back to 1969, when I was teaching scripture to the infants class at the Warren Public School. I told the story of Jesus walking on the water to his disciples who were in a boat during a storm. And when I'd finished, a six-year-old boy, Murray, said, I don't believe that story. I was taken aback as I had not expected this response from a six-year-old, especially one who's a regular attender at our Sunday school. I expect that countless adults might have responded as Murray did. However, it's easy to limit this passage to Jesus' actions on the water and so miss out on other interesting and helpful parts of the story. I have enjoyed exploring this gospel passage and would like to share some of my learnings with you. Throughout the centuries, Christians have grappled with the concept of Jesus being both human and divine. As we read through the Gospels, it is easy to see the humanness of Jesus. He identified with the poor, suffering and sick folk that he encountered day by day. He even cried when told of his friend Lazarus's death. But how do we understand his divinity? The writer of Matthew's Gospel was key to portray both the humanity and divinity of Jesus. And this is clear in the story of Jesus walking on the water. Here, Matthew shows Jesus' divine power and presence. Jesus crosses the boundaries between the human and the divine, between earth and heaven. Matthew shows further that these same powers that Jesus demonstrates here are also available to other humans, first of all, to Peter and the other disciples. Matthew wrote his gospel at a time when Jesus' followers were being pushed out of the synagogues and so were losing touch with their Jewish faith, their family and friends. They were ostracised from folk who had been their faith family for years. This was a time of turmoil and persecution for them as they tried to develop a separate identity. Scholars agree that the boat can be seen as a a symbol of the early Christian community in a world of chaos, threat and risk. In order to survive the difficult times, the followers needed to keep focused on Jesus who could support and guide them. 
In the Bible, the sea represents chaos. This was a deeply held notion of the Jews, as well as other peoples, because the sea represents what cannot be controlled. The disciples were feeling at sea because of the circumstances of their being pushed out of the synagogues, and so therefore they wanted to cling to Jesus. This chaos is also represented by darkness, and it is in that very darkness, in the middle of the night, that Jesus comes to them. He does what only God can do and speaks with the voice of God. Peter, in his enthusiastic way, shows great personal faith by leaving the boat. But in the violence of the storm, he takes his eyes off Jesus and begins to sink. He cries out, Lord, save me. These three words are a prayer which has echoed among Jesus' followers throughout the centuries. Jesus stretches out his hand and Peter is calmed and saved. Now, in case you feel sorry for Peter being accused of little faith, apparently this is not a derogatory term, but shows a mixture of courage and anxiety, of hearing the word of the Lord and looking at the terror of the storm. The disciples then acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and worship him. The scholar Eugene Boring says, Matthew's desire is to encourage readers to identify themselves and their troubles with the beleaguered disciples in the boat, to sense in the approaching presence of Jesus the goodness and greatness of God, to focus not as Peter did on the hardships that surround them, but on the one who summons them to trust and come to him and to acknowledge and worship Jesus as God's son. This week I've been reading a newly published book, God and the Pandemic, by the British New Testament scholar Tom Wright. He gives some insights into how the early Christian communities lived out their faith in difficult times. From the very start, the early Christians looked out at this world as Jesus had looked out upon his beloved people. They saw what God was wanting them to do and say, and so they prayerfully got on with it themselves. In the year 260, when a plague struck their part of the world, a quarter of the population died. The well-to-do people ran to the hills, whereas the Christians stayed. They nursed the sick, attending to their every need, and ministered to them in Christ. Many of them caught the disease themselves and died. No wonder the gospel spread, even when the Romans were doing their best to stamp it out. Over the next 16 centuries, through plagues that wiped out 60% of human population, historians credit the caring actions of Christians with not only saving countless lives, but with promoting the growth of the Christian faith. Tom Wright likens this to the response of some people in the UK to the COVID pandemic this year. The government asked for volunteers to help the National Health Service with all the extra urgent non-specialist tasks. Half a million people signed up almost at once. Retired doctors and nurses came back into the front line. Some themselves caught the virus and died. In Australia recently, large parts of New South Wales experienced the terror of bushfires. Good, brave folk responded immediately putting their lives in danger to save the lives of other people, animals and property. The call of God went out and those with faith and those without faith answered that call. Jesus stands in the midst of life in the deep water and calls us. As we respond to the call, we may face turbulent times. The times we may be unsure of our direction but we move forward knowing that it is what we are called to do and God is with us. We move from our comfort zones to those who are outside the fellowship of our church community to share and live out the good news of the gospel. I have been thinking about my involvement in the Pitt Street congregation over 30 years and trying to remember a time when I felt like Peter. 
The Pittstree congregation in the 80s and 90s joined the Community Refugee Settlement Scheme as we believed God was calling us into this ministry. We were allocated a family each six months and were asked to care for and support them as they adjusted to life in Sydney. A small group of us would carry out many tasks, including finding accommodation for each family, registering them at government agencies, enrolling the children at school and the adults for English lessons and many other tasks. Some of the countries our refugees came from were El Salvador, Vietnam, Bosnia, Somalia and Ethiopia. We visited these families at least once each week. Having to enter into the grief of these folk who were dependent on us was really hard. They grieved the family members they had left behind in their country of birth. They felt overwhelmed by their circumstances, confused because of little or no English skills, fearful of what each new day would bring. As we tried to support and encourage these dear folk, at times our response was to cry out, Lord save us, like Peter. Yet the word came to us, I have called you into this ministry and I will support you as you care for these my refugee children. Trust me. And we did. Times of great happiness and joy followed as these dear folk learned to stand on their own two feet. We were sad when Philip Ruddock closed down the scheme and handed it over to businesses that were paid to do what we had done for free. Quoting Geoffrey Plant, when we are fearful and overwhelmed by the waves, where do we place our faith? In the mighty storm or in the one who even the wind and sea obey? Such faith does not mean certainty. It means the courage to live with uncertainty. In the words of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, such a faith does not mean having the answers. It means having the courage to ask the questions and not let go of God as he does not let go of us. Now back to 1969 and little Murray Turrell. I don't remember what I said to him or to the class that day. If I was in that situation today, I would say, Murray, I don't know if Jesus actually walked on the water or not, but I do know that the disciples believed he did. And that's why this story is in the Bible. What I do know is that Jesus loved his followers very much and he was concerned that they were so frightened by the storms and the waves. He went to them, he calmed the storm and taught Peter and the others that he was always with them, even when they couldn't see him. They could trust him to help them through difficult times. Jesus is always with us too, you and me. We can depend on Jesus to help us all the time. Amen.
Let us say together, we believe that what we see before us is never all that is possible. That beyond our present is a future which could be new with more than enough for all and compassion greater than our own. We believe in God who is found in the midst of fear across the waters of life which threaten to swamp us and whose heart is love beyond our understanding. We believe in a greater power for good, taking the best within each of us and all of us and more, which flows between us and at the centre of the universe in ways of mystery and grace. Let us pray in thanksgiving and solidarity. In the midst of all that is difficult in our lives and in our world, we reach out with all who are suffering, have lost hope, or are living on the edge of life. Transform us to seek the common good as we look out for the many who are vulnerable, physically, mentally, socially, or spiritually. Gracious God, grant serenity and peace of mind to all who feel life is without meaning, or who are paralyzed by fear. May they find hope and faith in you. May your healing touch of kindness, love and generosity Affirm us as we seek to live life fully, encouraging us to move forward, knowing we are held and nurtured by you. In our circle of prayer today, we remember the lands and people of Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania and Niger. We're thankful for welcome and provision for those who often must flee across borders. We pray for effective response to the frequent droughts and hunger in this area. Here in Sydney, we pray for the people and ministries of the Assembly Office President, Dr. Deirdre Palmer, and General Secretary, Colleen Geyer. This is normally the time we would bring our offerings. We give thanks for those who have taken steps to do so via direct debit and so continue to support the work of the church, for it has not stopped. We continue to give in response to the gifts we have received. We dedicate our lives and all gifts offered to the hope that calls us toward reconciliation and healing for all peoples and all life on earth.
May we go into the coming week thankful for the life that sustains and renews us and open to the grace that surrounds and surprises us. May there be awakened in us long-held hopes and a longing for the spirit of life which creates, liberates and inspires us. And may the God of love, liberation and life be with us and with all life on earth. Amen. <laughs>